Why did the video go viral? Often we feel that, that, that people don't behave well and I think we see that there is no sanction for it. For that moment people felt somebody did wrong and was put right. We have the, this, this fabulous entity or tool which is our local council um, and often people don't equate the term local council with the council that is actually in your parish or town. The assumption is it's it's the it's the bin emptying, it's the pothole re um, repairing council, um, and sometimes that can feel quite remote from people. If we can encourage people to look back at that very local level of town or parish council, then they can actually see that they could make a difference. And one of the things that I continue to bang on about is how important it is that we don't just have the same old faces. It's the same old faces will bring the same old issues. So that, you know, if we have greater diversity in our councils, then what we will see is a better understanding of what the community needs. Hello. Today, the New Statesman is talking to Jackie Weaver. Now, you might remember Jackie Weaver from the winter lockdown and a local parish council meeting that went viral on Twitter for, well, I would say all the right reasons. She became an internet sensation when she was accused of not having the authority and uh, not having read the standing orders. She held her own. She kicked some people out of a Zoom parish council meeting. She's since done numerous interviews, featured in The Archers, and has a new book out. Jackie Weaver, you do have the authority here. Good morning, Jackie Weaver, and thank you so much for agreeing to talk to the New Statesman. How's it going? It's my pleasure. Um, it's going quite well, um, but surprisingly busy. I, I'm still amazed that people are even the slightest bit interested in anything, I have to say. <laughs> well, that was going to be one of my first questions, which is... Why do you think that uh, that you have become such a, a media sensation or that that particular uh, parish council meeting got so much attention? And uh, and how does it feel to have become the the face of correct Zoom meeting etiquette? <laughs> Gosh, there's a lot to unpick there. Um, every now and then, um, um, somebody on uh, Twitter, my Twitter experience, uh, you wonder where I'm going with this, but my Twitter experience is normally very positive. But every now and then I get kind of a comment from somebody like, really? You know, what on earth have you got to offer? And I always reply the same way. I am just brilliant. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what else is there to say? I mean, I, I have absolutely no idea why people are interested in, in what I've got to say. Um, I, I, I kind of feel that. And I suppose I felt it for a while, um, mainly, I think, as I've got older and perhaps a little more confident about saying, you know how sometimes you have thoughts in your head and you think, I'm not going to say that out loud because it sounds too stupid. But as I've got older, I've realised that actually often those thoughts in your heads are exactly what everybody else is thinking, but nobody wants to say. Um, so I've got a little bit more confident about saying them. Um, and it, it's that that we seem to be missing from everyday life. People seem so anxious about everything they say that we started to say so very little. Um, and, you know, my view is that the thing that has got lost is just plain common sense. And why did the video go viral? I think that is one of those things that is, I guess they call it a perfect storm. Had any of the... Um, the point's not been there. Had we not been in lockdown, had the two students in London not picked it up, et cetera, um, then nobody would ever have, have ever have heard of it. Um, but I think what really struck a note with people, and th this is my view, um, not particularly what they've told me, is I, I think often um, we we feel that, that, that people don't behave well. And I think we see that there is no sanction for it just you know we see some appalling behavior and we just go oh well yeah that's not nice I wouldn't want to do that and I think in that moment irrespective of what else was going on um you know on that screen I think for that moment people felt somebody did wrong and was put right um and I think that no matter what walk of life you come from there'll be some resonance there um for you 
you think there's a, a dearth of accountability and consequences when I it do. comes to to people overstepping their authority? I do. I, I mean, I wouldn't even, um, you know, f- sort of finish off that sentence. I would think, I, I just think that there is a lack of accountability. And I think you can put that in whatever walk of life you're in. I watched the video. I was enthralled by it at the time, as I think many people were at that point in the winter lockdown. Um, The other thing I thought was interesting about it and about the whole debate that it has sparked is it gave people an insight into local government and how government operates at the at the most local and the most community engaged level, which is something that many people won't be particularly familiar with. And I just wondered if you felt that um, what you were able to, what that, 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 that insight that it, that it gave people, that there are so many levels of decisions that get made in our communities uh, at every level that we don't pay attention to or that we don't particularly understand. And perhaps it prompted us to be a bit more engaged, and a bit more thoughtful about that. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's a hugely important point. And, you know, I hope um, that, I'll, you know, I've had a lot of fun over the last six months. Don't get me wrong. I haven't, you know, constantly had a nose to the grindstone and done nothing I've enjoyed. Um, but one of the things I do try to get across is that we have the, this, this fabulous entity or tool, which is our local council. Um, and often people don't equate the term local council with the council that is actually in your parish or town. The assumption is it's it's the it's the bin emptying, it's the pothole re, um, repairing council, um, and sometimes that can feel quite remote from people. Sometimes I think it is, um, and they feel that they can't influence. And then take it a step further and talk about national government, where the perception is that you can't influence. And you're absolutely right, you can't influence what's happening at national level. And I think that in turn has made people just switch off from from local democracy altogether. So if we can encourage people to look back at that very local level of town or parish council, then they can actually see that they could make a difference. And in a time frame, that means you won't be quite as old as me when you see that it's actually changed something. So as an expert in that level of, of local government, explain, can you explain what it is that parish councils can do and what it is that individuals, if they do engage with them and they do pay a bit more attention, what what changes could we make to our communities that perhaps we, we wouldn't be able to make just by, I don't know, tweeting at our MP how angry we are about something happening across the world? It's an interesting and terrifying question at the same time. Um, I mean, I've been involved with local councils for over 25 years and they didn't start 25 years ago. You know, local councils in the current format have been around since 1972 in the current format. Before then, they had a slightly different structure. Um, So these are not new. You know, they're not something that just kind of appeared during the millennium. So the fact that you're talking to people who genuinely have no idea what you're talking about is frightening and disappointing. Um, And I guess one of the difficulties when it comes to talking about town or parish councils is the variety of them. You know, you can't immediately talk about one and someone will go, oh, yeah, I know that's exactly what I've got in my my town or parish because they all look different. So um, let me take Cheshire for an example, because Cheshire is my patch. We have the tiniest parish councils, which might have um, an electorate of, let's say, a couple of hundred people. They might raise a precept. Now, precept is is literally a council tax, just like you see on your annual council tax demands. In fact, if you don't know whether you're in a parished area or not, dig out that precept, that tax request, and you'll see whether or not you are paying towards a parish council. It'll be on there. Um, So some of them will range from a few hundred pounds, a thousand pounds perhaps, up to one of our largest town councils, whose precept, that's tax raising power, is £2 million. Now, that's not a tiny little, you know, drop in the ocean. Um, It's not something that is just kind of worrying about, you know, a few hanging baskets. You know, that is a, a council that is delivering services for local people, but more importantly, paid for by local people. And I think that's sometimes one of the things that that people don't appreciate that huge difference there, which is when you pay your your, your council tax to your principal authority, it will be used across the borough 
or across the county, depending on who you're paying. So it may be that your your small parish, your small town sees very little of that money reinvested in it. When you have a, a council tax that's um, delivered by a, a principal, uh, by a parish or town council, it can only be spent in the area for the benefit of the people from whom that money was collected. So what do they do? I mean, the kind of things that they, they do are so varied. Um, so we have, um, you know, sleepy um, rural parishes who might do things like help with clearing verges, ditches, ponds, perhaps providing play areas for children, perhaps supporting local groups. And I think that's something that's incredibly important for town and parish councils is that in turn, they, I, think the, I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase pump prime, that they kind of put a bit of money in, not a lot sometimes, but to small community groups that in turn go out and deliver a shed load of stuff in that community. And often these small community groups, and they're not looking for millions, they're not even looking for thousands. You know, a hundred pounds can make a huge difference to a small community group struggling to get off the ground. It may be that your borough council has, um, you know, a pot of money that it, that it allocates for, for such grants, but it will be the kind of, um, it'd be oversubscribed. And again, you know, you're going to have to convince somebody who doesn't live in your patch what the benefit is to them in giving you money for your patch. Whereas, again, we're back to that very local aspect of our town and parish councils. So um, that, that's the smallest ones. The largest ones might be running um, transport schemes, um, might be running um, um, social care. Sorry, when I say social care, I don't mean they're taking on social care responsibility for the whole borough, but they might be running things like lunch and clubs, visiting um, arrangements, that kind of thing for local people. Um, I, I mean, anything you can think of, there is the possibility that that parish council is involved in it. And again, the reason that they are not um, kind of uniform is that they are reactive to what the community needs and not all communities need the same so you're talking about uh, an inst institution or, or, or small institutions that provide services for things across a person's life basically from, from from when they're born and they need services for children all the way up to care for the elderly and, and social care and, and everything in between but as you said it's something that most people, lots of people have no idea even exists or that they are paying for it, even if they are. Um, how would you, as someone who's been working in that area for two decades or more, how would you like to see engagement with that change? Do you think it's important that engagement does increase or is it the kind of thing where the people who care turn up and get involved in acrimonious Zoom meetings and, and those that don't just tick along very happily without ever knowing about it? It changes the, the, the scene. Um, if the only time that people really want to get involved with their local council is when they're unhappy about something, um, you know, that, that, that's a pity. Um, because actually, um, the biggest value from a town or parish council comes when you have people that actually want to do things within the community. And one of the things that I continue to bang on about is how important it is that we don't just have the same old faces because the same old faces will bring the same old issues. So that, you know, if we have greater diversity in our councils, then what we will see is a better understanding of what the community needs. So, I mean, my hope is um, that the government will reconsider, um, uh, ra rather prioritise um, a little bit of legislation, just a tiny little bit of legislation, it won't take long to write, um, about enabling um, virtual meetings to continue. Because I think that that was something that was really making an impact on people because with relatively little effort, you're able to go, well, what's all this about? I'll just have a little look. And it's very difficult for someone like me to sell parish councils because I, I can only ever talk generally or about Cheshire. And the thing that really kind of ignites the fire in people about their local council is when it is something about their locality. That's what makes the huge difference. So when you're looking at Handforth, um, after you get over the kind of excitement of the, the video that went viral, if you watch the rest of the meeting, 
it was talking about, um, oh, let me see, they were talking about how many um, parking spaces they needed at the um, the railway station. Um, they were talking about the new housing development that's proposed. And if you don't live in Hanforth, who cares? So it's very difficult to sell a parish council on the basis of somebody else's because it's not that interesting. But if you can watch from the outside your own parish council, you know, look at what it is that they're doing. I rather think that there'll be something in the community that will grab your interest and then we'll have you. <laughs> Obviously, the people who get involved are not politicians in the way that we, we normally think of the running general election campaigns and going off to work in Westminster and they're not professional politicians in that sense. Um, one of the things that we saw on the video was people, as you said, behaving in not particularly the most civic minded way. And obviously there are issues when personalities clash um, and when the, the business of a council can't get done because of those those personalities. There didn't seem to be that much accountability other than uh, parachuting you in there to, to kick them out of a Zoom meeting, which might have been a bit harder had it been an in-person meeting. So if parish councils and town councils in this area of local government is so important and ha- can make this kind of an impact, but you have amateurs who, very dedicated amateurs, but who don't have anyone holding them to account. How does that work when things go wrong? I I can understand why you say they're not held to account, um, but actually they are. Um, or they can be. That, that's perhaps a better way of putting it. Um, and this comes back to the earlier point about making people more aware of them. Um, because every four years, it's an all-out election. So every four years, those councillors have to stand down. You know, they cease to be councillors. And the community then elect their councillors. Now, unfortunately, if there isn't any community interest in the council, same people will get in they'll be the only people that stand they will be the people that get in but if you feel strongly about something and you want to affect change then get out there and canvas just like a real politician and then you see an actual difference and in that sense it is the community that holds them responsible and although I absolutely take your point about them being um I'll I'll say unprofessional and, and, you know, take it in the way I hope um, people think I meant it. Um, That's not always the case. Um, So, I mean, we we have many um, very um, influential councillors at borough council level, um, county council level, who in turn started as parish and town councils. So it's a really good place to get a, a base or a grounding Um, in local democracy. And if you are interested in a a truly political career, it's a good place to start to build your networks Um, because then, you you know, you have a better understanding of the general system because you'll be involved in a lot more than just the the parish council meeting. Um, And it gives you the opportunity to develop in that way in, in, in what is usually a very safe environment. And don't forget, if every parish council meeting was half as exciting as Hanforth. You'd see an awful lot more of them on YouTube, I suspect. Is that your plan then? Stardom on on, on YouTube and now mainstream national politics, the the Jackie Weaver Standard Standing Orders Party. Over twenty five years ago, uh, it must be nearly thirty years ago now. I forget to update. You know how you tell the same story and then you forget to update the years. Um, it must be about thirty years ago. I I did actually stand as a parish councillor and I did a term almost, um, and it is not for me. Um, I am eternally, I genuinely, eternally grateful to all those people that give so much of themselves as councillors. Often it's only the bad ones that we hear about. Um, but behind the scenes, there, there are literally 100,000 town and parish councillors across the country. And the amount of energy, effort, time, resource that they put into their communities is laudable. So I, I am in no way dissing any of our parish councils, but it's not for me. Um, for me, I much prefer to be what I call the uh, magician's assistant. I prefer to be in the background facilitating. So, you know, be be um, safe and rest assured that I will not be running for political office anytime soon. Is there anything, though, that you think 
national politicians and the way that politics is conducted at a at a national Westminster level could learn from taking a closer look at local democracy? I, I think over the years I've kind of um, become less dismissive and more sympathetic um, to um, senior um, party politicians senior party politicians um and again i i I hope this doesn't cause too much offense um but my sense is that when you become if you want to be a successful career politician i think you have to leave some of your personal aspirations at the door um because then you know it's about delivering what a collective has agreed it's going to deliver um and i guess i know that's not for me but I cannot see under the current system how that could be any different. And I find that quite depressing. But they could tell they they could tell the truth more often. Tell the truth. I, I don't lie. I may not always speak it. <laughs> um, when I do, you, it's true. You've got a book out uh, on, on your guide to life. Um, and one of the... <laughs> One of the things you touch upon very briefly is other leaders or leadership styles that you admire. And I noticed that you, you had a list of fictional characters, including Cersei mm. Lannister, I think, which yes. is a bold choice. Mm. Um, mm. But but no current political leaders mm. at all. Is is there no one on a, on a who's who's in a leadership position at the moment that on you, earth. you admire? <laughs> no one on earth that you think might be getting it a little bit right. I took too long to answer, didn't I? Which in <laughs> turn is the answer. I really struggled with that um, because, of course, the um, the publisher asked exactly the same question as you do. No, no, honestly, Pet, we need real people. These are not real people. You know that, don't you? Um, yeah, I, I know they're not real people. Um, however, <laughs> and, and in some ways, I think there's... <sighs> life itself is is too much compromise. We have to compromise in order to live with each other. Um, and I guess that um, that was one of the reasons why I chose um, Cersei Lannister, for example, um, as perhaps a strange role model. Um, but in, a, in an imaginary fantasy world, um, she was someone who did not compromise. And that's not how we can live our lives currently. Well, you've inadvertently become... A sort of unexpected feminist icon. I think mm. partly because I of... looked that up. I, I know what it is now. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, firstly, would would you have called yourself a, a feminist, let alone a feminist, feminist icon, before this happened? And 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 secondly, that was partly a result of people, I think, being quite inspired by how a a, a woman managed to quietly uh, not let herself be shouted over by a, a number of quite impassioned men I just wondered if you had any thoughts about different leadership styles and perhaps what we think of as markers of authority versus what's actually possibly a bit more productive I mean I I guess for me one of the um it has all of this has been a very steep learning curve um so so start from, from there um and on Twitter somebody referred to me as a feminazi which perhaps means more to you than it than it does to me. I had to look it up, um, and I did think. I, I wonder if you got me confused with somebody else, um, because I say my whole career has been spent working with with middle aged white men, largely, um, and hardly blazing a trail for for womanhood. So I, I'm not kind of sure um, why that would be something that he would um, he would see. But do you not think that's that's interesting that you um, calmly and politely stood your ground and a reaction to that was an accusation of being overly aggressive and being too loud and taking up too much space? Yeah, I, I, interesting. Of course, I don't see the difference myself because had they been women doing the same, the reaction would have been exactly the same. I didn't, at, at that moment, I don't see them as men. I just see them as people. Um, and, and I guess it's it's perhaps um, 
<laughs> it's more about my, my own um, mentality, I guess. I'm one of those people that is awful with names. But um, if you tell me what we talked about or you remind me of the problem we discussed, I can remember that in acute detail. Um, so I'm more interested in the, like I say, the magician's assistant. I'm more interested in the issue than I am about the the kind of person in front of me, if that makes sense. So often that means that I'm not really looking at whether you're a man or a woman. I'm, I'm just looking at what do we need to do here. But you do talk about leadership styles and yes. how to be listened to and how being the loudest and the most aggressive is not necessarily yeah. the way to get your point across. So, so what is? I, I think it depends on the situation. Um, but in, in my experience, um, first of all, listen. I, I mean, it, it amazes me how often um, people particularly who are very keen to, to kind of um, put forward a point have to jump in first. Now, that just means that everything else that's said is going to ride over everything you've said. <laughs> and what you said is going to be long forgotten by the time we get to the decision making point. So listen to what other, other people are saying and then come in at the end with your killer blow of the point that you knew that was really important. I mean, it comes to leadership styles. I guess that I I kind of feel that my father, um, and again, he's not living, so I can't refer to him as a role model in that sense, um, is probably the biggest influence. Um, and um, he was someone who, who believed very much that you lead by example um, and you don't ask anybody to do something that you would not do yourself. So um, I guess for me, um, it, it isn't about kind of shouting to people that, you know, I'm the boss. It's about showing that I'm the boss because of what I do um, rather than because I tell you so. What's your best trick or tip that you've picked up after all your years running meetings of how to make sure that whatever's being discussed, it, it ends with the thing that that you wanted or that your, your best way of getting things done in the way that you think in the face of adversity. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that people who, who like to control things and I like to control, I know I do, um, is that they jump in really quickly, you know, kind of back to my earlier point. Um, and, you know, as soon as the, the item hits the table, they're clear that we've got to give a steer to it. We've got to tell people where we're going and we don't trust people to get there on their own. And actually, if you give people space to talk, first of all, it gets it out of their system. They feel that they've had the opportunity to make their contribution. Secondly, it may actually change your position. Maybe they come up with something that you hadn't thought of. Maybe it's a different dynamic to, to whatever it was you were thinking about. But at the end, you can bring it together and wrap it up in where you wanted to go in the first place. But the alternative is that you lead from the front and you fight them all the way. I haven't got the energy to do that, have you? <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier about uh, Zoom and remote meetings being useful for, for local democracy. I think over the last 18 months, we've all got a bit of a love-hate relationship with video conferencing. Um, do they make, in general, I know there are pros and cons, does it make meetings better or worse? They, and is it something that you kind of think continues? Does it make meetings better or worse? No, it does neither. Um, but it's horses for courses. Um, I mean, there are some meetings. I mean, this meeting is would be nice if we were in the same room and had coffee but at the same time it gives us both the opportunity to have this meeting which otherwise we might have been under a lot of pressure to do physically yeah so I'm not sure that there is any disadvantage to us having this meeting in this way and the advantage of it is I guess that of course we can share it more widely if, if you choose to share it more widely um, I think there are some meetings that are better face to face and I think undoubtedly, if you're one of the things that I found very challenging during lockdown is when you're trying to do things like mediation, um, it is possible to do it um, virtually, but it's not easy. Um, so I think there are some meetings that most definitely are better face to face. And there are some meetings that are perfectly good virtually. 
I read your your guide to Zoom meetings, and um, I've got I've got an issue with it. And I'm sorry, I know you're a doctor. <laughs> what is your aversion to cats in meetings? To cats in Zoom meetings? I think I think they brighten everything up. Bless you. Of course you do. I've got one. I've got one around the corner that you can't see. Screen. Blackie it's, Weaver, I why guess... do you hate cats? <laughs> I, I don't hate cats at all. I, I love cats. I have dogs at the moment, but I most definitely have had cats during uh, during my life. But I guess it's the distraction point, and I picked cats. How can you not want this in a meeting? Because <laughs> I can just still remember the video meeting with a tail, you know, kind of just being batted out the way or wafting on the screen. Um, but it, it, it's the distraction point. I mean, I was at a meeting, um, a virtual meeting last night with quite a large group of people. Um, and I I can't believe that somebody would actually, and I choose my words carefully, shovel a biscuit into their mouth like that when their mouth is only six inches from their camera. It was really distracting. And there was somebody else that, that clearly had the computer just kind of looking in the room where they had headphones on. And they were kind of going about the room doing stuff. It was that weird. So it's about the distraction rather than the anti-cat movement. Other than no cats, what are your three tips for holding a successful virtual meeting? Oh, gosh. I mean, in many ways, um, they're going to be exactly the same tips as for holding any other meeting. Um, and I think it really starts with be prepared. I mean, I, I think there is... I, I mean, it frustrates the hell out of me when you have someone that starts with, um, hello, uh, are we all here? Um, uh, yeah, well, just wait till I get my agenda. I know I've got it here somewhere. Yeah, well, did we not know we were having this meeting? So be prepared, particularly if you're going to be the one leading it. Be on time. It is just as rude to be late for a virtual meeting as it is to be for a real meeting. And I think then, particularly if you're the one hosting the meeting, be aware of people in the meeting, what's going on with them, because you would do that if you were in a real meeting. And I think we kind of forget that. So that, you know, as I just talked to you about two people that, that kind of stuck in my mind from last night, um, sadly, they weren't the two most important me people in the meeting. You know, that they weren't people who spoke. Um, but, um, you know, do keep do be mindful, because if it's something that's distracting you, it's probably distracting other people as well. And it's just downright disrespectful. And finally, one thing that you would change about politics at any level. Um, code of conduct. Um, so um, councillors um, at, um, at all levels of local government, um, and I think they have a different code, but they also have a code at um, politician level, um, have a code of conduct. And unfortunately, um, because of different um, revisions to it um, nationally over the years, we now have one that is completely toothless. And I think that although um, I, I often speak about how you um, encourage people to do the right thing, how you support people to do the right thing, there comes a point where you've tried all of that and they're still arseholes and something needs to change. And you need a code of conduct that has some proper sanctions in it so that when you see behaviour like you saw at Handforth, you don't need someone to eject them from a Zoom meeting to make it clear that their behaviour is unacceptable. And we need to be able to demonstrate that to the public. I think we've all got some political individuals in mind who that might apply to. Um, Jackie Reaver, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.